Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, and uh, welcome to our uh, presentation on CCR diving in the Galapagos. My name is Aaron Arngrimson, and I'm the owner of the Dirty Dozen Expeditions. We specialize in technical diving and rebreather diving trips to Bikini Atoll, Galapagos, Truck Lagoon, and Palau. If you look at this photo here, this is from Galapagos in December 21. I just want to introduce my other half here, who is actually a special guest speaker at this presentation. It's Jorge Mauhat, and he is the founder of Galapagos Rebreathers. And between him and his two brothers, they are the only two, uh, three people in total that can operate, well, that can guide on rebreather in Galapagos. So. If you ever wanted to do it one way or the other, if not with me, they're the ones. So I have a real expert here with me. Uh, their two brothers are here stationed with me. You can see Javier is over there and Eduardo is in the corner. So when you're on a trip with us, a rebreather only trip in Galapagos, they are the experts. I'm just tagging along. <laughs> so the topics we're gonna face talking about the Galapagos Islands, Jorge is going to give a great introduction of that. Then we're going to talk about diving in Galapagos in general, what it's all about, uh, the factors considering there. Uh, we're going to talk about CCR, rebreather considerations when you are diving in Galapagos. We're going to touch a little bit on the travel logistics, how to get there, you know, what kind of money to save up and so on. And the expedition vessel that we're using on these unique rebreather only trips. There you go. So, um, welcome everybody. And uh, like Aaron was saying, we started this venture with rebreathers in the Galapagos 10 years ago. Um, and I, I, first thing I wanted to tell you where the Galapagos Islands are, right? So that's the equator and that's South America. And we are 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador. Ecuador is the name of the country. And uh, the Galapagos Islands are a volcanic archipelago that is uh, right smack into there. They were discovered by Charles Darwin. Um, I think we all kind of know who that is. And uh, that is a cool slide with the journey of the Beagle, which was the boat Charles Darwin was on board when he visited, stopped in the Galapagos Islands. You can see it was not the only stop. Um, that's the photo of the boat. And uh, that's Charles Darwin. He is most known for writing the uh, theory on the evolution of species. And uh, that is one of the main topics we talk about when we are in the Galapagos is speciation and how these weird animals came to be because they were so isolated. Um, anyway, back to the Galapagos. The reason this slide is here is because I want to explain to you why the dive conditions are so special there. So we are a volcanic hotspot in the middle of the Pacific. It's all volcanic lava. And these islands arose from the bottom of the ocean out of nowhere. Um, and because they're there, there is a lot of currents and counter currents that affect the archipelago that bring all sorts of different conditions in terms of uh, productivity of the water, water temperature, and these currents interact in the most crazy ways. And if you look at the heat maps over there, we have basically two times of the year, the very hot season and the not so hot season, okay? So uh, late December to May, we call it El Nino season, right? Because the El Nino current is the prevalent ocean current. And we have really warm water coming up from uh, uh, Australia. Uh, and then we have the mid-July, late December Humboldt season where uh, the Humboldt current coming, is a deep current coming from the Antarctica. It starts to create um, upflows and we got cold water, right? So all these different currents have brought different types of animals and you'll see some of the cool stuff that we have. Now, the, the conditions will vary greatly depending on what time of the year you're there. And uh, it's really important that you understand that. 
Um, Galapagos is known for having interesting surface conditions, right? So that is a normal dive in uh, Darwin's arch back in the day when it was an arch. It collapsed recently, so that photo is a little bit old. Now it's like two pillars, but uh, there's that. That's how it looks now. But what we really want to look at is it can be challenging to be in the surface, right? And so diving in Galapagos is recommended for uh, rather advanced divers, and you really need to have experience in choppy water. You need to have experience with currents. Um, some of the wildlife that we see in the Galapagos, that's why we do rebreathers, right? So this is a little bit of a change in the paradigm. Rebreathers come from technical diving, you know, uh, longer dives, more affordable in terms of gas, right? But we found that using rebreathers for wildlife, natural history diving is just a fantastic thing because it allows us to spend longer underwater. And uh, the wildlife has a behavior that is what, the closest to their natural behavior, right? So they're not scared by bubbles and stuff anyway. So, uh, Aaron. But just to interject, because we all think about when we go to Galapagos, I'm going to see a lot of beautiful marine life underwater, but you'd be surprised about the stunning things you can see topside as well. And that's kind of part of the trip is, you know, your brothers are both naturalist guides. And oh my God, I asked them one question and they just have the en entire encyclopedia of Galapagos in their heads. They're, they're so knowledgeable. So when you go on these topside tours, you really learn a lot and it's really valuable. When we took this photo, we'd just come out of a dive and all of a sudden we spotted this orca on the surface. And, and what happened was that we just jumped back in the dinghy, you know, rebreathers, no rebreathers, just jumped in our dry suits. And, and we, we went not to chase them, but just to be around them. What they were doing, they were swimming around the iguanas, which are in this very specific place in the Galapagos. And they were just eating them like french fries, like appetizers. You see nature in action. And once they'd finished that, they carried on to the main course. And we started seeing them breaching out of the water with a turtle in its mouth in real time. And then it just kind of blew and we got spit all over us and it was just amazing. So yeah, sorry, back to you. <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a National Geographic documentary every day, basically. It's, it's, a, it's a really cool experience. Um, some of the um, uh, animals you can see topside, right? Um, like we were saying, it's a, it's a documentary every day. And what we have next is a video from a filmmaker who was in the Galapagos and, and diving with us, uh, filming for uh, Sky in uh, the UK. And this was for the production of uh, Galapagos in 3D, narrated by David Attenborough. And so he was kind enough to do an endorsement video and we wanted to put in some, like, you know, the, the experience that you get out of diving a rebreather in the Galapagos is the closest you'll ever be to being inside one of these BBC documentaries or whatnot. So let, let's see if this play. I'm Michael Pitts, I'm the water cameraman here on location in the Galapagos. As a professional cameraman, I'm fortunate enough to travel right across the globe to some of the most remote places as imaginable. So I'm often asked by fellow divers, fellow photographers, where is the best place to dive? And my answer has always been, there is no best place, there are many. Um, but after being at sea for three weeks, traveling around these truly incredible volcanic islands, I, my answer now has to be, there is a best place, and it stands head and shoulders above the rest. It's the Galapagos from the most charismatic of sharks, the elusive ocean sunfish, and right down to the small fish and invertebrates that live on the sand flats. You have it all. But to do this place justice, you really do have to dive on a rebreather. With your rebreather, you have the time, you have the silence, and you have the ability to stay down so much longer and observe behavior that so few other people actually get to see. So I highly recommend coming here with a rebreather. Traveling to the Galapagos with your box of equipment and camera gear is always going to be a challenge. But once here, you can be secure in the knowledge that you have the dedicated support of one of the most knowledgeable dive guides I have ever worked with, Jorge Mawat. Jorge will facilitate that trip of a lifetime 
and will help to make it one of the most memorable. Anyway, so really, if, if you're going to do it and you dive a rebreather and you can afford it, it is the way to go. So here's, here's the trip information, right? Right. Well, I mean, I don't know about you. I, I, my, I started my company focusing on wrecks. So throughout my diving career, I started by enjoying, you know, reef fish and all that stuff, moved on to technical diving, you know, about 15 years ago, then got into cave diving quite heavily for, for some years in Mexico. And then I just started my, my wreck diving phase about seven years ago uh, when we started uh, running tr charters in Truck Lagoon originally. And I honestly, I thought I was dead set on wrecks for the rest of my time because I love it. And I was quite happy going to truck and bikini every summer and winter and just do that. But then I got lured into the Galapagos. Uh, so if you're a wreck junkie, don't, don't discount it because the, the, the encounters you will have are just absolutely breathtaking. That there was nothing that could prepare me for the moment when I saw uh, hundreds of hammerheads at the same time on closed circuit. Because there is literally no comparison. And I can say that with authority because I watch open circuit divers in Darwin. And then I'll go on rebreather with the next group. And the interaction with the marine life is just second to none. You know, bubbles scare the hammerheads specifically quite a lot. They're quite skittish around it. So when, when we're there, they get up close and very personal. So, uh, and, and, and the variety of marine life. I mean, I wanted to see a mola mola my whole life and they're everywhere, you know? So, so yeah, the variety is really great. But uh, getting on the, well, you want to talk about this a little bit, about the water temperature and stuff? Ah, well, if I, if I can touch on it a little bit, the water temperature when you're in the Galapagos, you can see it goes from 24 Fahrenheit in March and then down, all the way down to around 16 in October. I just came from Galapagos uh, last week, and I can tell you uh, the first part of the trip, like the first half week, was quite comfortable around 23 degrees Celsius. What's that in freedom units? <laughs> like 80 Fahrenheit or something? Um, yeah, yeah, 72. So quite comfortable in a, in a dry suit. The second half of the trip uh, was is the water gets significantly colder. And I think we were down to 14 degrees, which would be probably somewhere around 50 Fahrenheit. It got pretty, very cold at the end. And that, that's not something you'd expect. So uh, when you're going to the Galapagos, you actually have to dress for wild, quite cold water. I mean, the same kind of temperatures you get in the United Kingdom, you know, 14 degrees Celsius, 50 Fahrenheit, whatever. Uh, so yeah, that's something I was surprised about when I, when I first went there. But again, it depends on the season with El Nino and Humboldt. You want to talk about this a little bit? Um, so why, why are the Galapagos so important? In way, see, there are lots of volcanic archipelagos all over the place. The key for this is the welling of marine currents and bring nutrients. And that feeds a uh, food chain that brings all these animals, right? So that's an explanation on how these things work. And, and basically, we have deep currents, Cromwell, um, humble current, bringing up wellings of plankton, and then you saw the whale sharks, right? And everything in between. So that, that's, that's pretty much why we have such a special place in the world. Yeah. And that's, you know, something I, I didn't expect either. You'd be quite happy watching, you know, a big school of hammerheads, and all of a sudden an upwell comes in, and before you know it, you're freezing. <laughs> it's really a significant like thermocline that happens when it happens. Um, talking about the expedition schedule. So uh, once we embark the boat in San Cristobal, which is right here, we basically just head out on a, on a big circle of the Galapagos Islands, you know, culminating in Darwin way up north and then heading back down south and around and back to San Cristobal. You can see, bit more details here on the on the TV. We are spending, you know, a few days at Darwin, a few days at Wolf, and then visiting places like Fernandina Island, uh, Cape Douglas, uh, we're going to Isabella, and a few other places. 
we don't like to have the same itinerary on our trips. We like to make every, every single trip a little bit different. And even in this case, we have to because the Galapagos uh, Marine Park, uh, you have to send them the schedule for the week that you're doing and then they approve it or disapprove it based on the boat traffic that's there. Uh, so yeah, you, the, that makes it a little bit fun. You know, every trip is a little bit different, but I think for most people, it's really important to see uh, Wolf and Darwin. Like that's kind of where the, the highlight is for me. That's where you get, you know, the big school of hammerheads, a lot of activity going on. Uh, but obviously on the other islands, they're also special for their unique variety of, uh, of marine life and the iguanas and so on. So why rebreather diving in Galapagos? And we talked about this a little bit already, but we might as well uh, take a, take a bit deeper into it. We have extended range capabilities, which allow us to go where the wildlife is. So when, when they're usually doing a recreational charter in the Galapagos, we are talking about four to five dives a day. I don't know about you, but my ears can't do that anymore. <laughs> Two dives a day is pretty much what I can tolerate. And that's really good because you get in the water, you do a you know, 110 minute runtime or whatever. And trust me, I, I know people that have asked me, wait, we can do more than that. Trust me, you don't want to do more than that. <laughs> Once you are in a four knot current for 110 minutes, hanging on for dear life, you're, you're pretty done after 110 minutes. I can guarantee it. Um, but yeah, doing it in two sessions like that, it works really well because if you get in at a good time and the activity is really high, well, you're not going to run out of gas and have to go up and come down and then it's empty. You can stay and enjoy the entire session where there's high activity. So there's higher chance to have a successful dive, in my opinion. Uh, we touched a little bit on this. Silent dives allow closer and more intimate, intimate encounters with wildlife. I can tell you that is very true. Um, when we were filming uh, our uh, cinema stock last week, we got some incredible encounters, uh, small groups, you know, just sitting there forever and waiting for, a, for good activity. Um, obviously, the warmer, moist gas is working much better in this colder climate. It's nicer for thermal exposure. Uh, time management, you know, when you're, when you're there, you don't want to waste time. These trips are expensive. <laughs> you want to get the most bang for your buck. And I can tell you with certainty, doing it on a rebreather is, is going to give you back the experience in spades. Because no matter if you're doing this on a single tank or a rebreather, the price is more or less the same. So if you're actually going to go for it, you might as well go on a rebreather if you're certified, you have the equipment. Uh, I, yeah, you, you get, get the most out of it that way. Um, what else do we have? Yeah. I mean, the, the hidden factor is very good, being on the rebreather. Uh, it, yeah. So, we, I, growing up recreational diving, right? You got, and this has different progressions along life, but you get down there and somebody sees something and everybody goes, oh yeah, a shark, right? And, and you got a bunch of divers running after this animal and the animal goes away. People get a little bit more mature. Right, and you start learning that if you sit back a little bit, you know, you could have that experience for a little bit longer. Um, what the rebreather allows is the cap capability to kind of be invisible underwater, right? So you learn to understand the cycles of the animals and, and you are able to go where they are. So Aaron was talking a little bit about water temperatures, right? Um, and depending on the water temperature, how the, where the thermocline is in the water column, we're gonna have the activity around that area. I've, I, in my personal experience, I found that sharks like to go come in and out of that thermocline and they wanna be kind of right close to the warmer water, but not all the way cold, right? And so depending where that thermocline is, that's where we wanna be to have the best experience. That is something we can only do with a rebreather. Right? We're talking about nitrox diving depths where you really need an optimized mix of gas to be breathing continuously to be able to stay there for as long as you need. So that's what the rebreather gives us is, is the ability to be there, be quiet, 
be stealth <laughs> and just understand how everything is going under. It's, it's like I said, it's a really intimate experience with the environment. So I, I just wanted to bring that out. Oh, great point. And uh, just touching on the exposure protection again, because I mentioned dry suits and people are like, oh, well, what if I don't have a dry suit? Semi dries are perfectly acceptable. Something like a, a Hollis Neotac, you know, is going to get you through the trip quite nicely. You might be a bit cold on the last couple of days, but, but, uh, but that's fine. If you do bring a dry suit, heavily recommend it to have field replaceable seals. I cannot stress enough when you're in tropical climates how you can destroy your seals on a trip like that. And if they get destroyed, you are in trouble. So what he has there, you know, he can swap them out if need be. Uh, that's something I'd really recommend. Uh, gloves and hoods required. Uh, gloves in particular. And I say that, I mean, if you look at my hands right now, I don't know if you can see it, but they are torn to shit. And that is because I've been in Galapagos. <laughs> uh, they, they simply, you know, you're, sometimes you are hanging on for dear life. And you're wearing these Gorilla Gloves, these black Gorilla Gloves. You can get them in hardware stores. That's the ones we need to use because they get torn up. People that use regular dive gloves, they're going to run through a couple of pairs by the end of the trip. So, yeah, shake my hand later, you'll see. <laughs> so that's definitely recommended. Talking about currents, they are strong. Um, I rode up to four knots, but I'm sure you've had more, Jorge, over your time. Like what? Yeah. Yeah, it can, it can get ugly. Um, and now, so in your, with every breather, you're generally going to have an larger volume right so you have this thing on your back you have a stage cylinder bailout and you know it's kind of awkward so it's harder and you have this loop going you've been in current with open circuit gear where the you know it's free flowing in your face it's not good on a rebreather you know you tear up your mouthpiece you start getting a little bit of water so um the bands that go around those are great the, the ones used for deco for resting a little bit, that helps a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, reef hook, you know, experience with reef hook, very good here. And then obviously we require people to use a Nautilus lifeline. I actually had to use one on the last trip. Uh, and the thing is, if you, uh, if you don't have one and the boat misses you and it's uh, sunset, well, good luck. We'll see you in Indo or something. <laughs> so, you know, having that is an absolute requirement. Uh, understanding the risks and being prepared to act when you need to is imperative because when we're doing these dives you have to understand that the penga drivers that, that, that drive the dinghies they can't see you you have no bubbles right so how are they going to spot you at the end of each dive obviously the, the team leaders are pumping up uh, smbs to find us right but until then we're pretty much invisible so yeah it's something to take into consideration that's why for example Nautilus lifelines are required. Let me say something. So, so um, we we get you know rebreathers. We get awesome tech divers that show up with perfect buoyancy and trim, and you know they're they floating. I don't know three feet a meter from the bottom in like perfect position. That doesn't work. <laughs> Here you're gonna be hugging the rocks, wedging yourself in. Okay, to try to hide away from the current, stripping you away, and to try to hide out so that the animals are not, you know, they still they still can feel it. Like the the um, electronics of the rebreather, they'll still get a, a little bit of a feel for that. So, uh, if you're gonna bring a dry suit, bring patches. I I found that laminate dry suits uh, kind of get holes in them. So be, be careful with that. I, I know it's heavier, but a, a neoprene, a crush neoprene or something is, is, a, is a lot more sturdier in those conditions. But bring a patch, bring aqua seal, that kind of stuff, because you can, you can tear it up. So some of the considerations we have with regards of making a rebreather expedition to Galapagos, working with Galapagos rebreathers, we have something that's just called the CCR tax. So there's a one-time fee that you pay when you sign up for the trip. And when you arrive, you have unlimited SORB and O2. You can chew through as much as you want. And I want you to. Uh, my motto on the boat is, new day, new scrubber. I don't care if you did one dive. I don't care if there's two-hour runtime on the scrubber. New day, new dive. Uh, a new, new scrubber. 
And then obviously with the O2, we have a requirement there as well, 2,200 PSI, 150 bar uh, minimum in each diluent or O2 before every dive. It gets filled before each dive, this is important. Uh, we want you to wear appropriate bailouts. I've seen it far too many times that people want to wear S40s at you know 100 feet plus in strong currents where you have strong chance of hypercapnia. If there was really an incident, like that could be it. And you think an S40 is going to take you to the surface, it's not. So when we're diving in the teams, we wear a minimum of S80. We can split it into 240s if you want to do like a wing style configuration, but that's the minimum gas required when you're diving rebreather in Galapagos with us. Uh, what else do we got? No, there's lifeline. Yeah, that's pretty much it for CCR considerations. How to interact with marine life. Do you want to jump into this one a little bit? Uh, yeah, stay out of the way. They, they'll do the job, okay? We, the guide, is going to put you in the best spot possible to see these animals, okay? And if you hide as best as you can, they'll come to you. You don't have to go chasing anything. Just stay out of the way. Um, and that's something I'll just interject on, like that behavior, it's also just about being a team player. Everybody's paid a lot of money to come on this trip. Everybody has a $10,000 camera when they're on this trip. Everybody wants to get the best shot ever. We get it. But that doesn't give one person on the trip a right to swim right out to the hammers and scare them away every single time to get the money shot. So that's a really important part of our trips. You know, we must do what the guide says. We must respect and not chase the marine life. Obviously, when you're at the end of the dive and everybody's had enough and you're like, OK, you can nip out and try and get like a, a, a shot. But it's also just about being being considerate and working, working together as a, as a team and being gentle to the reef at the same time. The, the Galapagos National Park, it's a really well-conserved area because it has a lot of restrictions and rules on a lot of things, okay? And some of those apply to the way in which divers can interact with marine life and uh, on land too. There's nothing crazy. There's nothing you wouldn't read on a good, well-written dive manual, right, on how to interact with life. But sometimes we get people that didn't read the book. Uh, in those cases, the, the guide, which is another particular thing for the Galapagos, in the Galapagos, you need to have a guide to be able to dive underwater, okay? You cannot, there's no uh, buddy diving. Yeah, and, and if you're going to be on rebreathers, you need to have a guide who's on a rebreather, right? So, and, and the guides have a lot of experience. They know where the best things are, and uh, they know the conditions. So, it, it's really in your best interest to follow the rules and stay with your guide. And with open circuit trips, we encounter a pickle generally because we have different sack rates on people, right? So we've got people running out of air and trying to send them up. We rebreather, we don't have that problem. We can stay down for as long as we need. We do our business and we come right back up. And that adds a lot of safety to the mix. So it, it, is, it is a truly uh, safe, safety enhancing characteristic of rebreathers in this type of diving. There's maybe one thing I want to mention about like the logistics of the whole thing. So what we usually do is about like 12 months before the trip, I start getting the guests together like in a group on an email list. We start having Zoom calls. We start talking about like fright preparations and stuff. But we also introduce each other and we say like, oh, I'm diving a prism. Oh, okay, you're diving a JJ. Okay, you're diving a prism. Should we share the way we bring the spares? Because you would not believe, like, I'm starting to get a good statistics with the amount of rebreather divers we're, we're taking right now of the failures that we're having. And we are having a lot more failures than I thought we would. And uh, in Galapagos, when you're doing this, if your unit fails, if it has critical failure, like primary handset flooded, that happened last week, by the way, you know, but what I'm trying to say here is, you cannot have uh, enough spares for, for a trip like this when you're on rebreather. And we do our best to try and communicate within the team and people can bring you know, enough spares to, to make sure it happens. Because uh, obviously, if you're forced to go open circuit, you're going to have a good time. But we're going to try and avoid it when you come for a rebreather only trip, right? So yeah, that's something to think about. Important. I, I've seen someone have to miss the whole trip because he this diver didn't bring the 
one particular tool that was required to take out an oxygen sensor from the unit and they missed it. And see, I've seen people start trying to make stupid decisions oh, yeah. because they didn't remember to bring something, right? So, uh, and, and what I always say there is open circuits always your bailout, right? And it might not be the, 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 the trip you were expecting, but it, it will keep you alive a lot easier than trying to dive with a rebreather that is not working properly. Talking about the certification requirements, you can actually jump on a Galapagos trip with a Mob 1 certification. Uh, Deco, Deco is a good addition to have there. You're going to have up to 10 minutes of decompression uh, on a trip, more or less, between 5 and 10. Not too much, but, but uh, also we say normally minimum 30 dives with your current unit, not your brand new unit uh, that you just crossed over on. And then obviously good experience in current is much preferable, specifically with your rebreather. That's great. And we do make, I mean, we do test dives in the beginning of the trip. We take people out, we say, hey, shoot up an SMB. I know you're an instructor trainer, but just do it. <laughs> uh, you know, we practice the emergency drills and everything before we go out to, to Wolf and Darwin and make sure everybody's ready. And it's fun to watch. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, for, Half of you weren't here when we showed the video just to draw in the crowd, so if you don't mind, I'll play it for the second time. Uh, it's only two minutes, uh, but it's some stock that we shot last week in Galapagos uh, with our cinema equipment. So I just thought I'd give you an idea of what's happening there um, right now. So yeah, that's uh, something we're introducing now. Uh, we have a brand new 11 night itinerary for uh, rebreather only trips. It's usually been 10. We've added an extra night on based on uh, what people think. And that's something we're starting in uh, 2024. Next year is full already, but we're, we're taking bookings for uh, 2024 right now, up to 2026 actually. Uh, so with that shameless marketing, <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about the travel. So how do I get there? Well, I mean, I'm in the US now, so I guess there's a fair few Americans here. So for you guys, it's actually quite easy. I'm quite envious, because uh, United is quite an easy hub. You kind of just have to make your way down to Quito. That's a good uh, United hub, uh, or Guadalquil. And I've done it both ways. Uh, the first time I went there, I stayed in Quito for a few days to get over my tremendous jet lag, uh, which was fine. I got terrible altitude sickness because uh, Quito is at like 9,000 feet or something, isn't it? More or less, yeah. yeah. 10,000. Yeah, 10,000, yeah. So third highest city in the world, I think. So yeah, that, I, it didn't stick well with me. 
Um, and I kind of wanted to be on San Cristobal, a bit more in the mood. So on my last trip, I went to San Cristobal instead, and I stayed there for three days. And I'll hands down, hands down say I enjoyed that a lot more. And also because that's kind of where the boat is leaving from. So you could be in a hostel for 30 bucks a night in San Cristobal, and then you're, you know, 300 feet from, from the harbor where the boat leaves. You know, you've gotten your rebreather. You know everything is there. And that's, that's another thing. You know, you get there two days early to beat the jet lag. And then also, you can make sure that your rebreather is there. And if not, you can get on the phone, scream at United, <laughs> make sure they, they bring your luggage and your rebreather, and pray to God that TSA has not... Uh, mangled your rebreather. That's another thing, like we have, that's some of the things we do. We send you PDFs, official documents for TSA, to say, this is life support equipment, this is not something dodgy, back off. <laughs> so yeah, that's some, it, which you put next to your rebreather when you pack it. But anyway, uh, going to Quito and then San Cristobal two days before is, is what I'd recommend, and that's where the boat goes from. Anything you wanna add on that, Jorge? Did you yeah, it's if you're gonna do some ahead of time, it, it's it's great because if you leave something, there you you can have it and you don't lose your trip. We've had that plenty of times. You know, delayed luggage happens all the time, and so you then a few days early, there's time for your bag to get to you. So that that is a smart move. And uh, if you're not familiar with diving conditions in the Galapagos, uh, I highly recommend you spend some time doing some easier uh, land-based dives there. We can organize that. And it really pays off down the road on the trip because you are much more comfortable and you have a lot more understanding on how the, everything works. So it, it, it is a really, really good thing to do. Uh, this is our boat that we have for our new 11-night itineraries. It's called the Calypso. It's the first boat I've ever had in Galapagos, which has internet. So if you need to stay connected, it's actually possible now uh, at Darwin's Arch, which it didn't used to be. We used to go on a blackout for 10 nights. Uh, but hey, 2022. Big ass dive deck for all your rebreathers and all your needs. Really important. Uh, big and modern lounge to, to do all the expedition briefings in. Uh, the boat was, was uh, last in dry dock, fully renovated in 2019, so it's more or less brand new. And I have to admit, like, it was very roomy. We were, we, when we were on the boat, we were 16, and I felt like there was nobody on the boat most of the time, which is really important and comfortable when you're, when you're on a big trip like that. It's very roomy. Cabins, very modernized, so you can do this kind of expedition in, uh, in style. And these are the dates that we're doing. So in 24, it's in March, 10 to 21. 25, we're doing January 16 to 27. And in 26, we're doing 15th of Jan to 26th of Jan. Uh, at the very end, I just want to make a small announcement because we have worked thousands of hours this year to make something for you guys, the consumer. Because we know as a technical diving company that a booking process, when you're booking a rebreather trip to Bikini Atoll with me, you have to go through a lengthy exchange of emails, 10 emails, you get an invoice, you have to send a bank transfer somewhere. It, it's not exactly convenient. And it is the biggest complaint I've had specifically from Americans. You love convenience. And that's why I came up with the idea of making something different. I wanted to make it really easy for you to book this trip. Um, are we not still plugged in? <laughs> so I want to show you and, and reveal the new booking engine that we made, which is kind of like booking.com for technical divers. So now you can go online, book a quite advanced technical diving trip in four steps. And you can pay with Freedom Express, Visa, whatever you want. And it's easy and it's convenient. So I have a small video about that, just so you know how to do it, should you want to.
So uh, that's pretty much it. Like that's our booking engine. So when you visit that, you get a compressed version of all the information that we have. But one of the most frustrating things I had when I started diving, truck lagoon, bikini atoll, all these things, is just the lack of information that's online. It's impossible to find like one place where there's an extensive library to learn about the place you're going to, uh, which, which is helpful for a place like truck and bikini. So I've spent around six years uh, making this website, which I update on a weekly basis. We have a knowledge base in there. Uh, we have a lot of stuff for you to read about everything if you want. So if you go on the website, don't only visit the booking engine, go on the actual website and poke around. Uh, we also have a quite active YouTube channel with, uh, with a lot of videos. And yeah, that's pretty much it. One thing I'll say, um, this is Richard Lundgren from, from GUE. Uh, he just has like a little 20 second spiel on, on what it's like uh, to die with a Dirty Dozen Expeditions. Being part of a Dirty Dozen uh, expedition is quite unique. Uh, what it's all about is to gather uh, high capacity divers into one liverboard and then to go out and simply explore our surroundings. And that makes the experience quite unique because uh, everyone on the boat is passionate about their diving. They like challenges and they want to go and do extreme diving. So of course that's very rare to find in this world. Many operations uh, depend on bringing as many people as possible on the liverboards and so on, while this is quite a difference. Fewer numbers, more capacity and much more cool and badass diving. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> so uh, if you want to talk to me in person about any of these destinations, I'm just down the hall at 2057, right by Halcyon, right there. Uh, so come and talk about coming on a trip. I'd be happy to have you. Uh, we're almost out of time, but if somebody has questions, we have two mics, we can answer any questions if you have them. Anyone? All right, I think we're good. So if, thank you so much for coming, and I hope to see you in the Galapagos. Thank you, Jorge.